Hi, my name is Daniel Valdivia, and I'm an engineer here at Minayo. And today I'm going to talk to you about writing machine learning uh, pipelines against object storage and the reason why uh, you should be thinking about doing it that way. Right? So I'm going to be introducing you first to the par a part of the problem uh, about how traditionally organizations are writing machine learning models and using them in production. And then we'll see what are the cons about that model. Right? So let's get started. So this is the problem that, that uh, is seen around in the industry, right? So traditionally you have a machine learning engineer and these guys will have some really fancy machines, right? They, they have some nice CPU, some local storage, and sometimes even GPUs to speed up training, depending whether they're doing traditional machine learning or perhaps deep learning. Uh, and then they will, sometimes they cannot fill the whole data set, right, onto the machine. So they take a subset of that data. Right, so they can train because, of course, you, you are experimenting, you're testing stuff. You want to make sure that you got it right. And then they pick the framework of their choice, right? Sometimes they, are, they want to go with TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, most popular ones. They're working perhaps on a, on a Jupyter notebook, on a Zeppelin notebook, or perhaps they're just building the, the final code on top of it. And this is so far, this so far it's great uh, because it's actually encourages iterative building of the application. And it, this is where it still look, resembles a lot of traditional application development. Now, the problem with this is that usually when these engineers are done building the application, uh, the machine learning model being treated as an application, they, they throw it over the wall, right? And who catches this? That's the DevOps. And then the DevOps has the mission to take this application and go figure it out, okay, what data do I need to bring to train this? What, uh, where's the file, how I'm gonna run it. I'm gonna be doing this on top of virtual machines, on top of containers, uh, picking the infrastructure, right? I'm gonna be picking GPUs, CPUs, right? So it's, it's two, separate, two entirely separate worlds. And then uh, it completely isolates. And this, this introduces a variety of problems because for example, le let's look at it this way. Let's say you're training a very large problem uh, like ImageNet. So ImageNet is an image recognition project, right? So very, very firm is. But if you want to train this yourself or build something on top of it, the data set is 1.31 terabytes in size, right? So this is fairly large, uh, even for the average engineer machine, right? So, and it has 14 million images. So let's say a machine learning engineer that wants to work with this data set, you know, probably the data won't fit on his computer. And now when, when it comes to production, Let's say the engineer manages to fit this data set into his machine and wants to train, uh, train like this on production, right, to serve the model, um, right? These these nodes nodes with, that have you know fancy GPUs. Sometimes they have tensor processing units, or also known as TPUs. Um, this takes too much time to download. Imagine you're just loading the 1.31 terabytes of capa of data into the algorithm, and then the first part of the pipeline broke. And then you have to do it all over again, right? So this is one of the problems that traditional machine learning development and deployment strategies are, are gonna face, especially working with large data sets. And it doesn't have to be this way. If from day one, you, you have a healthy development cycle, you can actually uh, go around many of these problems. So let's, let's zoom in and look into uh, the stages of building a machine learning uh, pipeline, right? So, um, on, and why this is quite important, right? So I was telling you that you know, if you're training your uh, machine learning algorithms, doesn't matter if you're doing some deep learning, like in my example, I'm, I'm putting some TensorFlow logos. You can imagine this as well with any other framework, right? So usually compute tends to be quite pricier, right? So in my case, if I'm getting some VMs with GPUs or CPUs on the cloud provider, or just procuring that hardware for my data center, these machines are definitely gonna be way more pricey, right? So having them block, on doing basic operations like loading data in and out, uh, it's just too expensive, right? And this gets even worse if you're using an even nicer machine on the cloud, like the ones that use TPUs, those machines are gonna be way pricier. But comparing this type of infrastructure to storage infrastructure, right? In infrastructure can be more plentiful and it's actually cheaper to operate and, and host. So this is where the, the advantage of actually designing your machine learning uh, pipelines against object storage comes into place, right? You can design everything where you have a very large data lake of data sets, right? And you're at any given time when you need to train, let's say you keep your data on premise and then you want to train on the cloud when you need, only when you need to train, it's because then you get access to burstable compute, right? Or maybe some other uh, situation in your organization, maybe the compute is constrained, right? You have to time share it or something like that, right? So then you want to make sure that when it's your time to crunch, you, you don't spend time 
uh, actually loading data, you just want to go ahead and crunch the data, right? Perhaps you're sharing this uh, infrastructure for, for some other purposes, right? So that's, it's very important that to have a very uh, clean separation of the infrastructure. And I mean, the storage infrastructure is, is great if it's running object storage because it can be uh, built very large scale at a very low cost. So zooming into machine learning pipelines, usually how they are built is, you know, an engineer goes and he extracts some data, right? He extracts it out of somewhere and then uh, he cleans it up. He then pre-processes the data for whatever format the algorithm that he plans to use will, will take in, right? So perhaps he's training some image recognition. He'll, uh, he'll grab this and put it, translate it to some zeros and ones. Uh, and then he'll crunch it to some algorithm, right? So that's very important. Now, we'll train. This is the, the part that generates the data, right? So usually pre-processing and training need access to all the data, right, to, to do their parts. And then when you're evaluating the model, perhaps you only need a subset of data that you didn't use to train on. So you can test the, the, uh, the validity of the model. And finally, let's say you are serving this model, you want to deploy it, right? And then what, what you're deploying is just a resulting model that might be way smaller. Uh, and usually people take these ones, they bundle them on a container or virtual machine, deploy it to production and use it. But then uh, if you already like have this very nice pipeline, it's very important that you keep it continuously running so that you can continuously be training new models in a very easy way. If you have more data, you just want to crank a lever and get a new model trained. So more importantly, once the data, the, once the model is, is starting serving, you want to start acquiring more data and then be able to say, okay, I want to acquire more data and perhaps reevaluate my model and see if it's working or not. And if it's not working for the newer data, let me trigger a retrain. So some of the scenarios where this could happen, imagine that let's say you train a model uh, to do some character recognition. And let's say beginning of time, people only did zeros and ones. So you train the best model out there to do zero recognition. People will do it like these balls and then you will get them a zero. They will do a, a line and they will get a one. But then in the future, let's say some new trained users, they, they decided to start using a new fashionable digit they call two. And your model doesn't really recognize it because it was not originally trained on it, right? So it will do some faulty recognition of picking this as a zero. So this is where it's very important that you build your machine learning pipelines in a, in a mechanism that's continuously easy to just, uh, again, press a button and have them rerun the whole pipeline to train a new model against the newer, uh, either label data or unsupervised data that you're using for your algorithms and train it, evaluate it and deploy it all in a simple fashion, right? Now, if you see uh, all of these boxes, to some extent, they are be becoming components. So, and this is very important to look at uh, to look at each stage of a pipeline as a reusable component, because now it, this is where you know maybe extracting the data will act the same for you every single time, but pre-processing data can be improved over time. Let's say now we have some better techniques to pre-process the data. We made some decisions on how to do that. Let's say we had a, a first version of my training algorithm. And then we, we build a new, a new version, a third version, right? So looking at this as, as reusable components is quite important so that you can see the evolution of the pipeline. And then not the whole, it doesn't need that, mean that necessarily that the whole pipeline needs to be changed every time it's a, uh, something that needs to be changed about it. You can just simply change the component that you need to update, right? Or, or improve the component. Moreover, if your pipeline is already looking like this, right? Uh, you can imagine, yeah, perhaps I did this initially with TensorFlow, let's say, uh, and I use Python on TensorFlow code to extract, pre-process, train, evaluate, and then serve my model, right? And then let's say I containerize this and deploy it on a Kubernetes pipeline. So this could be my version one of my pipeline, and it, it could uh, be a very decent model, right? And this is actually the, the approach that we're going to be exploring through the demo, but uh, you don't necessarily need to stick to this, right? So you can start with this. And if you're structuring your pipelines so that they are continuously, uh, they're designed to continuously be run. And, but then they're not actually running on the data being, uh, they're not relying on the data being present locally at all time, because that, that's kind of like the, 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 the learning of the story, <laughs> right? So uh, it's, you, don't want, uh, you don't want the extract to be like downloading all the data, right, from the source and then putting in the file and then having to have that file copied over from hard disk drive to the next uh, container on the hard disk drive to pre-process it and then having another file and then copy it. You want to do something that glues this together, right? And moreover, perhaps this is not the right tools at uh, over time, you want to move into more modern solutions. Perhaps you say, well, 
My extraction now I'll do with Trino, my pre-processing I'll do with Spark, training TensorFlow, evaluating with TensorFlow, and then I'm going to use KServe to serve this. So when you start looking at your machine learning pipelines as modular components that you can actually start improving over time, it unblocks a, a, a world of uh, functionality over time. And what, uh, the point that I was also trying to make is how to glue this, right? So the, the right way is where object storage can be thrown in the, the mix, right? So that, you know, uh, data extraction is reading out of your data lake. Uh, that's your object, store, your object storage. And then putting it, uh, the extraction results into object storage again. Then the preprocessor uh, stage of the pipeline comes in. It reads that file, right, that, uh, straight from object storage, cranks it, puts it back into object storage. Then comes TensorFlow, trains, it reads straight from object storage. Right? It doesn't need to load the data entirely. It, if, if, uh, for example, in TensorFlow, we have the, the concept of estimators. So as training is happening on top of uh, the batches, uh, TensorFlow will uh, load the data that it needs straight from the object store. Right? Same goes for evaluation. And then the resulting model can also be pushed to object storage. And we can then have a single container for serving that's just reading a different model, right? And then that's how we do a quickly deployment. And then let's say for ingesting more data, you, you can bring any application of your choice, again, throwing more data into, into the object store so that if you reach a certain threshold, let's say you, you're, you have some unsupervised anomaly detection algorithm that you're capturing, I don't know, a lot of HTTP access logs through Kafka. And at some point you say, well, every time I, I get, every time, every after every single day or every X amount of hours, I want my algorithm to retrain automatically, right? So then that's where after Kafka has thrown enough data into object store, uh, object store can either tr notify you via Lambda notification or you can just uh, pull a lever and then start the whole thing together, right? So this is the, the importance of actually designing your machine learning data pipelines against your uh, object store so that you can uh, build these re highly reusable pipelines that can evolve over time and become more sophisticated, right? And deliver higher value. And again, uh, ma make everything more uh, useful, right? Now, most, most of the uh, concerns here is like, okay, how is this gonna look, right? So how am I gonna de develop these sort of pipelines? So for example, here, if I was de uh, developing around uh, uh, TensorFlow, right? And so let's say we will train that on top of ImageNet, for example. You will in, in structure your pipeline so that at every part of the pipeline you are uh, reading, reading, right? So and then passing on to the next stage, the next stage will also read straight from object store, and then so far and so back and so forth, right? So that's that's pretty much how you want to go about designing. In this case, the pipeline that we're going to be walking through the demo, it's gonna, we're going to train something smaller. We're going to train sentiment analysis. Uh, that's the, the hello world of machine learning, I will say. Uh, but we're going to be training that. And then what you want is to be able to do one, one thing at a time, right? So uh, one stage, we'll pull the data, uh, pre-process it, put it back in object store, next stage, and then next stage and next stage, right? So And this is something that most modern uh, machine learning frameworks can support to do. They Like all modern uh, popular machine learning frameworks support object store. So you can do this uh, in a very easy way that's non-disruptive to your workflow and even better, right? So maybe your engineer will be concerned, okay, maybe I don't want to be uploading and downloading all the data every time I'm making a test that they will still probably push back into, like, I want to have the data locally. But uh, some really nice feature uh, that you can use, like, if you, should you choose to use MinIO for your object store, is uh, you can run MinIO locally, right? So you can also use it for development. And you can trust that the same API will be available when you run MinIO on production and your pipeline on production. So that, that, that way your, your machine learning engineers, your data scientists, they can actually iterate and build their algorithms entirely around object store, right? They don't have to wait for, uh, they don't have to throw that problem for someone else to scale it. They're, they, they're building this nice, um, let's put it, this nice culture about, around how they should build machine learning, right? Because perhaps at, to some extent, at some point, they'll be like, someone's gonna already take care. Like, there's already some stages for pre-processing data, which I don't need to care about. Like I'm gonna start after those guys pre-process the data, and then I'll do something different. So perhaps some new model, some new prediction. So they, it's, it's a philosophy, right? So this is what is also known as machine learning operations. And it's the, the machine learning operations, it's the philosophy that as you are designing, you're designing everything around components, reusable components so that people can mix and match and then improve independent parts of the pipeline as it goes, right? 
So with that said, let's jump into a demonstration of this and uh, let's see how you could actually achieve this using TensorFlow for the, for the time being. You don't have to do everything uh, around TensorFlow, uh, like I'm suggesting. Uh, if you were following along and doing this on a Spark pipeline, let's say, you could pretty much achieve the same result. But the, the point to take home is pretty much the simplicity. And then the next thing we're going to do after like reviewing some simple design, right? So it's, okay, how do I make this into a um, uh, simple, how do I make this into a pipeline? And then run it in, so, in some orchestrator. So traditionally, and I showed you in the part where you could just run this on top of Kubernetes, but perhaps you want to pick an orchestrator like Airflow or Qflow, right? So something that makes it super trivial so that you can upload your pipelines and have them rerun and rerun and reevaluate what is this part of, uh, and it's even easier for debugging because now when you're, when you're looking at your pipelines, they may be, uh, they may be failing at a particular point and that's something we'll see, but okay, let's jump into it, right? So for, for this part, um, I'm gonna jump into my IDE into my notebook, right? So here I have an actually a like super nice IDE and what I'm gonna be, uh, you don't have to read through all of this notebook. Well, this is usually how I go about designing my, my machine learning algorithms, right? And by the way, all the source code that I'm showing on this video, it's available on GitHub. And we, you can also find it on the blog post. Uh, we have a blog post for Minayo, particularly for TensorFlow. So you can just look, Minayo TensorFlow, right? And then you'll find my hyperscale machine learning with Minayo and TensorFlow blog post, and you can follow along. Now, uh, in this case, as I'm designing my machine learning algorithm, I wanna be able to do stage by stage what I, what I need, right? So perhaps I wanna download my data, put it into object store, and then take it from there, right? So, so what I wanna do in this, uh, in this is pretty much go along with the algorithm, right? So this is how I will pretty much go about making my algorithm. I will install importing my dependencies, uh, setting some uh, base uh, parameters. In this case, I'm gonna be pushing everything uh, to my object store, right? So I'll be pre-processing some data into some bucket using the MinIO SDK to actually download the data that I'll be like extracting and pre-processing, right? So that's gonna be the first part of my pipeline, which is let's pre-process some data, right? So in this case, I got the ACL and IMDB data set. That's a data set of pre-labeled data that has some movie reviews. And some of the movie reviews are actually positive and some of them are negative, right? So I'm gonna download that data into object store right and th this is what it will come to expect and all of this part we're gonna uh, uh, pretty much skim through because uh, there's not not much we can do but pretty much uh, like a pre-processing pipeline right this is where you could actually uh, be naive in uh, building entirely around python right so for example in this case i'm being naive and just downloading the data crunching it and returning it right in real life you probably want to build it this on top of like i don't know spark so that if your data set is actually insanely large, you can actually distribute the pre-processing around Spark workers. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and actually pre-process my data, shuffle it, and then go around to um, uh, upload it, right? So now for the next part, I'm gonna be taking my, these data sets, I'm gonna be encoding them uh, using a, a layer, an existing, a pre-existing layer. I'm gonna be leveraging uh, Google's universal sentence encoder model Right, this is because I'm building a deep learning model. So something really nice about deep learning models is you can stack the layers, right? And, and leverage an existing model. So now after I have downloaded this, I'm just pre pretty much, I, I want to download it from TensorFlow Hub and put it into object store. Why would I do that? Why not have the pipeline downloads this model every single time? Just as I say it, you, you should probably be noticing like where you're running these pipelines and retraining, you don't want to be re-downloading from the internet stuff that you can pretty much cache in your, object store, in, in your object store layer and then have the pipelines pull at very high speed from it, right? Because that's running on top of your own infrastructure. So you don't need to be pulling things over the internet. And even if you are developing things, right? As a, a individual engineer, and let's say you're collaborating uh, on a local lab, if the data is, everything is on the local object store, things are gonna just go faster. So. After downloading the data and putting it into object store, that's what I'm doing on the first pipeline part. I'm just gonna download these things and then just load the model. So now it's, it's pretty much uh, as simple and then load, load the model, right? So, um, so far everything is still hi highly compatible with working with things locally. So the magic 
we'll, we'll start seeing the magic uh, after we're done pre uh, post-processing the data. In this case, I'm just gonna download, uh, have some functions to serialize my, my, my samples, extract them and put them. And now we're, we're gonna take some time, right? So this is the, where the part where I start pre-processing, of course, this is something that takes time, right? Especially if you're working with the whole data set. So uh, what we're gonna do here is through the magic of editing, uh, we're gonna jump to whenever that's done. I, man, I've always wanted to do this. All right, that took some time. <laughs> and after we're done pre-processing our data, of course, uh, you, now you want to get uh, in the business of training, right? So this is where uh, the, the things really start making sense about, uh, you don't have to load the whole data because for example, particularly here on TensorFlow, uh, I can I can start loading my uh, like right now I'm listing straight from object storage getting some list of files and um, to configure TensorFlow properly to read the data I just need to set some environment variables right which is something we set at the top and then uh, all the files I'll, I'll be prepar preparing them and this is where the the source comes right so as I'm giving uh, TensorFlow the data to read I'm telling it read it straight from object storage right I'm not actually telling it read from a TMP file or anything so that as my machine learning algorithm goes and trains, right, in, this, in the particular case of TensorFlow, we'll see the estimator loading the data as it's needed, right? This is also like a very common uh, pattern access, like let's say you were doing Spark, you won't be downloading the whole data set on every worker as you're crunching data. Spark will only be pulling the data that it needs to be actually be crunching. So, um, have I run these stages? Yeah, I have not run these stages. So, the, the, the nice thing about uh, preparing your data in this set is that, for example, this is the model that I'll be training, right? So it's going to be a pretty simple uh, dense layer. Uh, it's a couple of dense layers, and then just uh, applying a, an activation function on top of that. Um, how many weights? Yeah, I have not printed the weights, right? So it's going to be like 135,000 weights to to train. So it's not a very uh, deep model. Let's go, let's say that this way, right? So now because of my data, all my data is already on a on a TensorFlow dataset, right? And the TensorFlow datasets, that's reading string of object store. And I even pre-process my data into a format that's friendly to TensorFlow so that as the data gets, uh, needs, needs to be ready to process, it can just be uh, read straight from object store. And then each file has a bunch of uh, records to process, like a whole batch. That's how I decided to pre-process my data around. Uh, I'll just pass this around to, uh, uh, to TensorFlow. I'm also gonna tell TensorFlow, please, put my checkpoints on object store. And this is very important because as these trains, let's say the training is gonna take like a few hours or a few days, um, you wanna be able to check the progress and perhaps you wanna start TensorFlow, TensorFlow on top of that. TensorFlow is a great tool for TensorFlow users that they can see how training is going, even if it's not done, right? You can just go check at checkpoints and see what's going on over there. And then um, I'm just gonna throw the log directory for, for that and then just Here's the, the, the second part, model fit, right? So I'll just say, let's train this for 10 cycles, right? 10 epochs. So we start training, right? So, and then again, this is gonna take some time. Uh, so through the magic of editing, we'll skip to the end. Ready? <laughs> Ready? All right, training is done, right? So we run our data to train ep epochs. And now after this part is complete, uh, the rest of the, the of the drill, you, you already know it, right? So pretty much we will save this model straight to object store. I'm gonna uh, ask uh, how did the model did to my training? So we, we can see that part. And then I'm gonna run some evaluation about how good is this model performing against some data that I set apart from the beginning. And this data is also stored on object store. Therefore, uh, these uh, map data sets that I'm actually running straight from object store they can be fed by, uh, into the TensorFlow and TensorFlow can tell me like, okay, so you have like an accuracy of 85%, not, not state of the art, but I mean, I try to keep these trainings uh, small, but you get, the, you get the idea, right? So, and I'm not trying to go too much into detail about, about here because pretty much uh, I want to take you through like the normal cycle of what a machine learning engineer will do. And the last part is, of course, uh, loading straight from TensorBoard. TensorBoard could show me the, the throughput uh, or the performance of my algorithm. I could, of course, do some predictions. Here I have some sentences. Some of them are mean. Uh, movie reviews. So, of course, 
being, being able to say, yeah, this was extremely good. I loved it. It's a positive and then reacting negative, right? So you see some false positives over here. Um, so you get the idea, right? So the model is trained. It works 85% of the time. So and now we want to serve it. So serving is also something that can go straight to object store, right? So in this case, uh, I'm going to review my model using a, a CLI tool. Actually, this step was not needed for this part, for this video, but I can start, let's say, a TensorFlow model server, right? Uh, th there's a TensorFlow service, a technology for serving uh, TensorFlow models. There's equivalent in other technologies, but wh once I start this, I'm going to start it on a Docker container, load some Python requests, and then just make requests to this guy and be like, okay, show me, show me some predictions, right? So uh, I love this movie. And there we go. So I, I actually sent all my same samples through, through like through a JSON interface and I got what I was expecting, right? So you can see how uh, I'm gluing everything to object store so that when this actually reaches production, everything is ready, right? So now traditionally as a data scientist, I'll be saying, done, let's, let's take this to production, right? Now I could just throw all this uh, Jupyter notebook into a large Python file and of course, everything is ready for prime time. Just put this in a container. I will tell my DevOps, run it. And then things will work, right? So, but of course, uh, we've seen what, the, what is the problem with this approach, right? We, you can, it's not a highly scalable approach. And the, the main idea that you want, the main takeaway is, okay, this is, the, we want to improve on top of this, right? Now, the best part that if I, if I de design my whole pipeline uh, around very well-defined stages and I, on, very on purpose, I put everything into a single large file. I didn't try to, I could have organized this very nicely into separate files. You can do that. I actually encourage you to do that. Uh, for the sake of, the, of this video, I actually made it a very large file so that you could actually see that, for example, uh, my orchestrator of choice is Qflow for this video as well. Is uh, If I want to transition this to a pipeline on Qflow, it's going to be dead simple, right? So I can use actually, for example, Qflow um, pipeline components. Uh, function, Python functional components and Qflow, and I can just take my chunks of Python code, wrap them on, on, a, on a stage. In this case, pre -process, my pre-processed data function is going to be one of my stages, right? The other stage is going to be my training stage, right? All the code that you saw me run for training, my evaluation code, my deployment code, right? All of that uh, are going to be stages of my pipeline, and Qflow makes it very simple through their DSL, uh, like uh, kind of like the pipeline SDK has a DSL for actually designing pipelines this way. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just taking my code and I actually, uh, I don't want to bother you, uh, bore you with just me copying data from left to right. That's why I prepare this pipeline. But the, the, the main takeaway is that, okay, the code is already ready to read data out of a different location, in this case, object store. So there's no need for me to set up anything to copy data into the container, right? So I don't need to set up anything. Even better, I can just hit run on this pipeline on the right side. That will beam it up to my Qflow instance. Let's do that right now. And actually, I think I configure this to, to compile. I want to run. There we go. Let's, let's, ru let's run this straight. Like, let's not waste any time. Right? So let, let me, let's go to my Qflow set instance, right? Which I'm running here. I'm going to log into my Qflow instance. And... To, and nothing's gonna load. There we go. <laughs> That's the danger of live demos. Even with editing, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't tempt it. So let's run to, to runs, and we will see my sentiment analysis pipeline actually running. And you can see that all the things that we were doing and running it through my computer. This Qflow is already running on a machine with GPUs, so it's definitely going way faster than what my laptop did, right? So the pre-processing, the training, the evaluation, let's, let's pick at the evaluation, right? So this is going to throw me a, a file to uh, open, so let, let's, let, let me bring an editor for that. So after opening this, this file, I can see the, uh, the accuracy training, right? So because of random initialization, I was fixing a, a very particular random number, I got like better accuracy. Uh, on my machine, and I actually no. This is actually uh, the actually the same accuracy I got on my notebook. So, but you get the idea, right? So, what? But you get the idea, right? So, what? I, what when I was essentially running things before, 
let's see if this one opens. Yeah, this one opens in browser. So everything that I was running before on my notebook, because I is particularly designed it to read the data straight from object store, right? I was designing and developing everything running locally, right? So I had a MinIO running locally, copying the data inside everything, uh, reading straight from that place, pre-processing, putting it back, training straight from it, uh, saving checkpoints, uh, doing evaluation against it, and then finally serving the model straight from object store. It was that simple uh, that at the end, I just translated this to an orchestrator, in, uh, in this case, Qflow, and made it run uh, as a machine learning pipeline. Now, every time I need to return my pipeline, I can just rest assured that I can just pull a lever and boom, boom, now a new machine learning model will be born. Right. My, my last stage actually is leveraging some of the nice features from Qflow, for example, serving models. Um, ta -da. Am, I, am I running on HTTPS? Where's my model server? There we go. Yes, Every, nothing's going right this demo. But, you get, but here, right, so now I can do TensorFlow serving natively from Qflow. So my pipeline can actually take that upon itself so that when it's done, uh, if I if my evaluation goes right and I pass a certain threshold, perhaps that's when I move to deploy the model, and that and that's about it, right? So, so machine learning operations is a it's a development philosophy. That's what I've been trying to like. That, that's if anything you want to take from this uh, talk is that you machine learning operations should be a, a development philosophy. This is you want people to be like okay. I'm going to be a better pre-processing or I'm going to be a better extractor stage, right? But then they build it in a way that can be reused by someone else, right? So, uh, or they can also rebuild it, build their own machine learning algorithms on top of their own reusable components. So that, that's what you want your organization to move towards, right? So that the machine learning algorithm, uh, the machine learning pilots are highly reusable. Um, they can be highly auditable as well. So that's, that's one thing. The other one is, uh, you know, machine learning models may go stale, right? So that's why it's so important that you keep retraining with newer data, right? Whether it's newer label data or newer, newer unsupervised data. Because uh, business, cha business cases change, right? Your, your business will evolve over time and your models need to evolve with it, right? We saw that sample of the uh, opt uh, MNIST optical character recognition example that I gave you, where, you know, People may come with new digits, and then your model needs to retrain quickly for that. As soon as you gather some data to start identifying those new use cases, you want to retrain, right? So then storage infrastructure uh, is way cheaper than compute infrastructure, right? So if you're building everything around uh, storage infrastructure, right, compute, you can always burst it, right? You can go to the cloud and say, I'm going I'm to do this train on the fanciest GPU machine, TPU machine that I can, and then when I'm done, I want to turn it off. That could also be part of your pipeline, starting a, a fancy VM somewhere, have it run and pull the data from your data lake, and then shutting it off afterwards. And then your, the, the storage infrastructure tends to be way cheaper to operate than uh, compute infrastructure, right? So that, that's another very important uh, highlight uh, of why you should be designing your pipelines this way, right? So uh, we already touched on that building uh, all components uh, reusable has huge advantages, right? So you can have your machine learning engineers actually collaborating or in, or your DevOps actually improving parts, right? So like, let's say machine learning engineer doesn't know how to do Trino. You can get someone to do the Trino for them, right? So uh, someone says, well, we can crank this faster through us in a Spark cluster and we already have one. Uh, we can do that for pre-processing data, et cetera. You get the, you get, you get the core idea. And lastly, uh, yeah. Well, the machine learning models need to be continuously training or uh, they're going to go stale, right? And you don't want to do that. So that's been all for today. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. My name is Daniel Valdivia again. Please uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, hit us up on, on, on GitHub, right? Or join our, our public Slack, right? If you, you want to hang out with the community, if you have any questions about how to run your own object store, uh, you can ask us there or you can just visit our website, mean.io. And thanks for your time and hope you have a great time. Remember the, the, the source code is going to be available on GitHub and should be on the description of this video. All right. See you guys.